Next, I would like to introduce our speaker for today. Kirsten Conrad joined Arlington's Virginia Cooperative Extension staff as the horticulture agent in September of 2007. She was born and raised in Ohio and holds degrees from Auburn University in ornamental horticulture and landscape design and from Indiana University in outdoor recreation management. Kirsten has operated her own landscape business, written gardening columns for Daily News, worked for large commercial companies supervising residential landscape management and doing community development and public space design, and of course has taught countless classes. So welcome Kirsten and take it away. Thank you, Leslie. You all should know that Leslie Fillmore does a bang up job as the um, Master Gardener Program Coordinator here in Arlington. And we're also pleased to have two of our Master Gardeners, Julie Hanson Swanson and Nicole McGrew here to help facilitate this presentation today. So they'll be working with you in the chat box and um, we'll be stopping for questions as we go along. But welcome, welcome to today's presentation. I, I um, have to tell you that I was once paid the, what I consider to be the ultimate compliment by somebody who came to one of my programs and who said afterwards, thank you, this was well worth my time. I hope that today's presentation will be worth your time. Um, and of course that it will be, put, will be recorded and you can watch it again as we go along today. Um, as Leslie said, this has been coming to you from Virginia Cooperative Extension and the Extension Master Gardener program that helps facilitate these programs on a weekly basis. Um, the Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia were established here in 1981, and the Virginia Master Naturalist chapter, with which I also work, was established in 2008, both of which work very closely together um, and separately to produce public education on environmentally sound gardening practices and to promote sound natural resource conservation and land management practices. In addition to these two volunteer programs, my, my work includes pesticide management education, as well as invasives education. Um, as Leslie said, we also are based in the Fairlington Community Center, which is now open on a very limited basis to volunteers and the public to come in. The help desk can take samples and um, we can, can address your concerns by email as well as um, by, um, phone. So don't hesitate to contact us if you have follow-up questions and or additional um, concerns about pests that might be bothering your garden. So we talk about trees and there are a number of different organizations in Arlington and Alexandria, Northern Virginia working on promoting tree education. And this slide is a, uh, a poster from the National Initiative for Consumer Horticulture. Plants do that. And if you want to know more about that, you can actually Google plants do that and, and um, learn more about what they're working on. But this is a, a, um, a collaboration of university staff, business, uh, horticulture industry staff, and volunteer nonprofits that are trying to promote um, more understanding about consumer horticulture. One of the important things they have are some um, research-based information about trees and other plants. Trees are beautiful. And why do, we, why do we do this? Why do we why do we care so much about our trees? They keep our streets and homes and buildings cool. They provide shelter and food to wildlife. They improve drainage capacity of our soil and they produce oxygen. Many people know these things already, but trees also conserve water and prevent erosion. They increase property values and business traffic to organizations that have trees on their property. This is research-based. They promote unity, community unity, and beautify space, and they provide gathering places for people to come together. They also are shown to be viable partners in combating climate change. They shield us from the sun and help take up carbon dioxide from our atmosphere. We teach about trees because there's a tremendous lack of understanding about the value of trees. We need to understand and promote um, better understanding amongst our neighbors and in our communities about the investment and the return on the investment, both the cost too, of planting and caring for trees. They need to have periodic care and people need to understand that it's not a short-term project. It's not for the faint of heart. Okay, trees are valuable and they are not 
um, you know, made of, of concrete, so to speak. Okay, they need they need they people carve their names in the trunks. They hang you know bird baths and bird feeders on them. They nail you know basketball hoops into them. In fact, there's a T-shirt from Indiana where I went to graduate school that shows the Indiana state tree and uh, shows a basketball hoop nailed onto the side of a tree. Trees are planted in inappropriate places and they're expected to outcompete lawn grasses, flower beds, and concrete even. Um, we, we can't continue to plant trees in two by two foot plots, tree plots on streets uh, and sidewalks and expect them to live for a very long time. They need to be cared for in order to withstand storm damage, ice and snow loads, lightning strikes, and we still don't do that and expect them to live forever. So I wanna thank you for being here and I hope that some of this information you will be able to use to share with your communities. Today, we're gonna to talk about the basics of plant problems and plant problem diagnosis. Um, so you can be better prepared to address those issues. We're gonna talk about selected tree problems. We would be here all day if we talked about every single possible problem. So I have selected some of the most commonly asked about problems. And we're going to talk about best management practices and problem prevention. This picture is of a cicada damaged tree. And I know that most of you probably um, had um, the brood can emergence in your communities. And I want to hasten to tell you that there have been questions about what to do about these dead branches and dead leaves. These are simply the ends of the branches. It amounts to a little bit of pruning by mother nature and the cicadas and will, in a healthy tree, make the tree um, stronger and um, better able to withstand storm damage, actually, because the pruning will um, um, cause the branches to thicken up. Don't worry about it. So why do trees do poorly? Why do so many trees do poorly? Maybe it's a better question. Uh, we ask a lot of our trees, uh, insufficient watering, and or overwatering is also a problem for our urban trees. Um, many years ago, I was told that the average age of a street tree was about eight years. And I disagree with that. I think we have uh, managed to um, demonstrate better care for our street trees. We provide better planting processes. We also provide better undersurface root zone um, capacity for trees to grow in. Trees are planted at the wrong depth all the time. And one of the number one causes of tree decline, in my opinion, in our urban area, are trees that have been planted too deeply. The, tr the trunk flare where it comes out at the base of the tree needs to be above ground. If you see a tree that's going straight, a trunk that's going straight down into the ground without that flare at the base, that means that it has been buried too deeply. And that's almost a sure death, if a slow death for many trees. Girdling roots um, are stranglers, and if you can remove them, they need to be done at the time of planting. Especially right tree, right place. Um, the issue is that people look at a tree and they go, oh, I want one of those. And they bring it home and they plant it in their property without any concern or understanding of what their own conditions are. And so one of the important things that we need to remember is that we need to know the site, know the, the pH of the ground, know the drainage capacity of the soil, and choose a tree that fits that, those conditions. It's very difficult to change the conditions after you plant the tree. Poor specimen selection, again, it's about right tree, right place. It's about size of the, of the mature specimen. And uh, it's, it's also about um, the suitability in our climate of it. We promote the use of native trees that are used to growing in the kinds of conditions that we have here. Of course, in an urban environment, we're looking at conditions that are not um, exactly um, normal for the rest of the surrounding um, geogra geography. And so I'm encouraging people to experiment with cultivars of native plants that have been developed for warmer climates. Excessive heat, again, that's something that we can combat by choosing plants appropriately. Okay, and lastly, the competition with lawns and herbicides 
is a very tough and high bar for trees to overcome. They are not um, able to withstand the frequent watering or the fertilizer application and herbicide applications that we typically apply to lawns. And so one of the best practices of maintaining trees is to remove lawn from as much as possible from, or at least maintain lawn space from the top of the root zone of trees. So as we go into this presentation about tree pests and diseases, I want to just kind of put an idea in your head about how diseases and um, plant pest damage occurs in the environment. This is the infamous um, plant disease triangle. Uh, and it says that basically you have to have three components for a plant disease or pest or even uh, um, bad conditions to, to affect the tree in a negative way. You have to have the pathogen, the pest on the left side it has to be present. You have to have a susceptible host and you have to have favorable environmental conditions even though they might change over time, they have to, all those three things have to be present in order for a problem on a plant to occur. One of the basic understandings that this can lead to is that if we can simply break that triangle at some point on it, on this triangle, you can do away with the plant pest problem on your tree. Growing degree days, um, uh, it's a presentation that I did a few days ago for the Henrico Master Gardener Program and last year for our Master Gardeners here. Growing degree days are a measurement of the accumulation of heat units, which is important for the development of insects. It's also important for the development of plant physiological phenomena. For example, the bloom time of trees can be linked to the emergence of certain pests and it's far easier to see the bloom time than it is to see the insect emergence. But it helps us to, gives us one more tool that we can use to break this triangle. So other tools that we have available to us, we have biological tools in our tool box. And we've got beneficial insects and pathogens that are present that are helping to control some of our pest insects and disease problems. Uh, for example, um, gypsy moth, which was prevalent um, many years ago and still is with us, but has been reduced to a more of an equilibrium in our environment now, thanks to um, fungal pathogens, which have, and, and also natural uh, predators, which have kept the population somewhat in check and balance. Mechanical tools like pruning, sanitation, and mulching can cut down on a lot of plant pest problems if we simply use them correctly. Um, we do conduct pruning classes on an annual basis. Chemicals should be a, um, a, a tool of last resort, uh, but the pesticides and the pathogens in the pest sometimes need to be treated with a chemical control in order to shock the system back to a point at which the natural defenses of a tree can take over the work of controlling it. Finally, the cultural controls are definitely something that we can do, okay? We have control over this, uh, the cultural um, means of improving plant health. And that is the number one way that we can, um, you know, reduce the incidence of plant problems. Water correctly, reduce competition, choose the right tree for the right place. Diagnosis of plant problems, um, first of all, requires us to accurately identify the pest and the host and the severity of the problem. The pictures on the right side show two problems um, that look very similar. The top is something called an oak bullet gall, and the gall is a plant response to an insect um, um, uh, infestation. The oak lacanium scale is actually an insect itself. They have nothing to do with each other but they look very similar. And the picture on the top was sent to us as a, for identification. And it was identified initially as a, as a scale insect. That doesn't help us when we misidentify a plant problem and assign a control to it. 
it won't have any effect if we have done, if we haven't identified the plant correctly to begin with. If you know the pest life cycle, that gives us a big leg up on when and how to control pests effectively. You have the power and you don't have to guess about pests and what their life cycles are. We'll be talking about the University of Maryland's landscape IPM reports a little bit later and showing you how you can use that tool for your best effects. If you're not a subscriber to it, you can subscribe to it and it can be sent to you on a regular basis. Applied management options include resistant plant varieties. Choosing, for example, dirt heat river birch will prevent your heat stress on your river birch. Choosing Princeton American Elm, which is a cultivar of, of, of um, American Elm, will help you avoid Dutch Elm disease because the breeding program has built in resistance to that, um, that disease. Sanitation and the removal of dead, diseased, and dying plant tissue by a pruning or simply cleanups at the end of the year will help reduce the amount of inoculant and overwintering insects in your landscape. Biological controls like planting diversity. Uh, if you, many times if people have scale problems, we tell them increase the diversity of your flowering plants that are nearby to withdraw the predator insects like wasps that will help control your um, your scale problems. Cultural controls, things like removing weeds that are host for injurious insects will go a long way. But you have to understand what the pest is and what the weeds are that they, that they um, might need for the life cycle. A good example is Ailanthus. Sometime in the very near future, possibly even next year, we are going to see spotted lantern fly in our communities. And this is a terrible scourge, which we'll show you some pictures of later on. Um, simply removing Ailanthus trees, which is their favored host and an invasive plant of its very own, will reduce the amount of uh, spotted lanternfly in your uh, landscape. Okay, so there is lots of, lots of tools you have available to choose from. It's important to understand your disease characteristics and understand what you're seeing when you look at a, um, a plant problem. Plant problems are often specific to a particular plant. And identification is very simplified if we can identify the plant first of all. The integrated pest management tools include um, some resources that are really great for you to use. Powdery mildew is shown in the picture right here on lilac trees is a fungal disease that can seriously injure not only lilac, but dogwood and many others, including perennials. Will it kill it? It could. Is it not likely? Can it be prevented? Well, the answer is sometimes. But the best way to prevent it is to use resistant varieties, plants that are resist naturally resistant or have bred resistance to disease problems. Fungal problems are sort of unique and they need to be um, prevented as opposed to controlled after they start if you wish not to have them in your landscape. Avoiding overhead watering, which would have been a very hard thing to do this year with all the, the rainfall, um, can help. Increasing light and increasing air circulation are um, one, two of the major controls for fungal disease of all kinds. Okay, so. The other question that we need to do when we're looking at plant problems is, can it be tolerated? Is it okay? Are we gonna do something about every single problem we see? No, but the important tools that you can use to know whether or not a problem is serious enough to warrant action. One of those tools is the pest management guide. This is a pest management guide that's put out by Virginia Cooperative Extension on an annual basis. It, con it contains information about um, you know, perennials, vegetables, annuals, uh, pests of the home, um, pests of the home landscape outside, pest uh, parasites, and so on. So there's a lot of inf and lawns. Okay, there's a lot of information in this book, but you can access it through the VCE publications. It's free. It's online. I think you can even purchase a um, a bound and a hole punched copy of this book through the website. 
But when we're talking about trees, the pest management guide is going to be, the, the information you need is going to be in chapter four. The chapter four is the section on home ornamentals, and it has different sections in it that are important to you. The control of ornamental diseases, diseases of landscape trees, insects of trees, shrubs, annuals, and perennials, and so on, okay? It also talks about the um, chemical control as well as organic controls and talks about what those products are and how they work. Okay, so this is a very valuable tool in your toolbox to use. Let me show you what the kind of information you can expect to get from this. Not only does it give you the, uh, here's a entry for oak, okay? And this is from chapter four um, on diseases of ornamental plants, okay? It also has a section, of course, on insect pests of ornamentals and trees. But in these chapters, some of the pests and the pests that are listed after the plant are the ones that are most commonly encountered in Virginia, that the lab encounters in Virginia. The ones that are in italics are the ones that May, may benefit from or may require chemical treatment for control. The vast majority of them do not require chemical control or even any other kind of control. So your best option for limiting disease and pests is going to be to keep the plant in the most healthy condition you can possibly keep it in. Here's another example of those, those four I list that listed on that previous slide. Uh, anthracnose, powdery mildew, trabachia, leaf blister. Here's a picture of what they look like, okay? Um, this is oak leaf blister, taphina. It is um, something that is listed as possibly needing chemical control in very bad situations. Similarly, trabachia, the lower picture on the left, um, is something that, that we might want to seek control of for a valuable tree. Oak anthracnose um, is a particular fungal pathogen which only attacks oak. Anthracnose, however, consists of a big family of fungal pathogens which attack very specifically different kinds of trees and plants in our landscape. This top picture on the right, of course, is not a disease at all. And again, proper identification is going to be very key to understanding how to um, treat problems in the landscape. This top picture is iron chlorosis. And iron chlorosis is due to an excessively high pH. Well, pH, of course, is the measurement of the soil acidity. Many plants have very um, uh, broad ranges of, of acceptable soil pH. Some of them are very narrow. Uh, but we, it is known that a very high or very low pH or soil acidity levels, different kinds of nutrients are limited. And in this case, the chlorosis or the discoloration of the leaf is due to a limited supply of iron in the soil. It's not a deficiency of iron. It is a limited accessibility to the iron that is there. Why is it limited? Because the high pH ties up, the high soil acidity ties up the iron in the soil and makes it unavailable. The other thing I want to tell you is that we get a lot of questions about plant, tree, disease, leaf spots, particularly this time of year and moving forward into October. Most tree leaves as they begin to, most plants as they begin to shut down their natural defenses and shut down their vascular activity um, as they approach fall are going to become more susceptible to leaf spots of all kinds. And so many times the proper identification of, of a leaf spot problem, this time of year, the advice is going to be don't do anything about it because it's a, just a normal process that, of shutting down the, the plant defenses. But if we can identify something that we know might be a problem in future years, we will give you advice about how to um, limit that reoccurrence um, either through cultural means or mechanical or even chemical means, okay? All right. So in summary, if you are giving or seeking advice, know your diagnosis checkpoints, know the identification of plants, 
I ask about the general history of plant health. And any of you who have worked with me out in the field know that I go through this whole litany of questions. And if you bring something to the help desk, you will see us see a form called the three-in-one form. And the three-in-one form is a form that helps us get down to the, to the nitty gritty of what is going on with your plant. It asks about the history of treatment of anything. Um, it asks you whether or not it's a single specimen or multiple species. It asks you what the patterns of injury are. Is it on the top, is it on the bottom, uh, inside or out, one side, progression of symptoms and so on. And it all depends on the, the treatment of a problem. Again, depends on proper identification of the, the plant and the proper identification of the problem. Is this basswood blight? Well, I once got called out to a home that claimed to want advice about basswood blight. Well, not only did they not have basswood blight, they didn't have basswoods. They had Japanese hollies. Okay, so identification matters a lot. Symptoms and signs can also help, under, help us to understand uh, what's going on with the plant. A, a symptom is a plant response. It's a plant response to a pest or a pathogen, which is causing the plant to have stress and produce some kind of response. A sign of a plant problem is going to be the actual presence. It's going to be the insect presence, the, the skins of the insect, the eggs of the insect, the um, fruiting bodies of fungal organisms and so on. The picture here is of slime flux or bacterial wet wood. And this is a, 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 a plant response to a bacterial infection inside the tree, which is causes the, the high pressure and it causes the tree to weep it out. Does it kill the tree? No, probably not. But it may be a sign of stress that you can alleviate through um, uh, eliminating and improving growing conditions for the plant. Many of you have been here for a while and know that we had an emerald ash borer infestation that has killed off almost all of our uh, untreated um, ash trees. The pictures on here are chosen just to allow you to understand the difference between signs and symptoms. Um, obviously, the larva that does the damage and causes the galleries, um, the S-shaped galleries under the back of the tree, and of course, the insect itself in the upper right corner, those are signs. Those are signs. The branch dieback, the epicormic branching of the, the produced on the tree, those are symptoms that the tree has produced, has, has some kind of problem going on. And in fact, branch dieback and crown thinning as well as epicormic branching can be signs of other kinds of problems besides emerald ash borer, okay? Tip dieback on trees is, is um, sometimes linked to root problems um, and um, epicormic branching can be linked to damage, um, you know, physical damage in the tree. So um, it's important to, to look at the big picture of the whole problem. We also have to deal with things like abiotic plant problems. And this is a, a, a real problem in the areas like ours where we have many, many um, um, you know, challenges from the built environment. Um, this particular problem shows uh, a pattern of injury on the top right picture shows a pattern of injury with the sidewalk and the damage going down the list, down the list, the, the, the lane of plants here. And uh, that kind of an injury, that, that regular repetitive pattern of injury leads us to a diagnosis of an abiotic plant problem or a problem that's not caused by a living organism. Okay, it's not caused by a disease, it's not caused by an insect, this is salt damage. Okay, um, similarly, the bottom left picture shows a white pine that has new growth that is um, uh, wilting, um, it's deformed, it's um, close examination shows no evidence of any kind of insect or disease, um, you know, deterioration on the plant. So what is this? Well, the time of year makes a difference too. This is new growth. You can see the new growth, which came out from the, um, from the older established pine needles there. And that new growth 
what has been shocked and possibly probably killed back by a late severe freeze. This is an abiotic plant problem. It's caused by weather. Abiotic plant problems come from in many forms. You know, one could argue that the um, that some of these might be um, similar to biotic plant problems, but the picture on the upper left shows damage from uh, a bird. This is a woodpecker or sapsucker damage, which is actually quite common. Does it kill the tree? No. Um, does it, does, can it, can it contribute to, uh, to stress at the tree? Yes, certainly it can. And so this is something that you're not going to be able to control the birds, uh, except by caging the tree somehow. So in, focus your efforts on making the tree healthier. Death by weed whackers in the lower picture, the lower picture on the left. And of course, you can see a similar kind of damage from voles in the wintertime when mulch is piled up around the trunk of the tree and voles come along underneath the mulch level and eat the, away at the bark. But this is weed whacker damage. And so what can we do? It's a cultural problem. Can we take the grass away and the weeds away from the base of the tree so this doesn't happen? Um, the picture on the right shows southwest disease. And that's just a, a, a misnomer because what this is is splitting of the bark due to the rapid temperature change that occurs in the wintertime. Uh, wintertime, we have the sun in the southern uh, hemisphere and we have um, um, warm sun shining on the bark of thin bark trees like maples um, and other and fruit trees. And when the sun goes down and the temperature slams back down to 10 degrees, we can get this kind of injury on the bark splitting and damage for, to the tissue from the freezing and thawing effort. Okay, we're gonna stop here for questions if there are any, but the next section is going to be uh, a review of common tree pests. Um, we would be here all day again if I tried to choose all of them. So I have limited them to some of the most commonly um, complained about items. Uh, the picture shows European hornet damage, which is not also not uncommon here. This is a, a phenomenon that these, these fabulous uh, predator insects, which most of us would prefer not to have around our homes, um, but, but they are nevertheless beneficial. Um, they, are, they strip the bark off of trees and they can actually do quite a bit of damage to the tree itself. And starting in September, I get started to get calls about this damage and um, limiting the um, removing, <laughs> um, controlling the insects on your home landscape can reduce the, um, the, the incidence of damage from this pest. But it's a dicey prospect. These are guys are, are, um, will vigorously defend their nest and anybody who comes close. So be careful. So let's talk about bagworms. And, and again, these are common and uncommon and we need to learn about them every year, it seems like, okay? This is a, uh, an, an insect that defoliates trees. Uh, it is mostly a problem in evergreens, um, arborvitae, cedar trees and so on. It has a, but it has a wide range of hosts, including juniper. Um, and I've even seen them in deciduous trees. I've even seen them in lawn furniture. Um, where they have attached themselves there. Um, they overwinter as eggs inside the, the, uh, the bag and the hatching starts in mid-May to June. Um, the male adults will emerge in late summer and sometimes you can see them um, crawling um, out of the bag at this time of year. The females, however, are wingless and they do remain inside the bag. Evergreens can be entirely stripped of their foliage um, by, this, by this pest. And one of the problems is that we don't catch them early enough. And when the young are hatching and they are feeding, they are feeding very rapidly in very high numbers. Some of the controls are gonna be chemical, of course, and they have to be applied um, when the bags are only about a quarter inch to one half inch in size. But you can also, um, check the growing degree days on the University of Maryland's IPM report, which I hope somebody has put into the chat box that we'll show again later on, to check the timing of when 
to most effectively apply applications of um, the organic control called BT. When the bags are about a quarter inch large, you can, you can do that then. Eastern tent caterpillar is very, very common. And the old timers will remember that the advice was to take a piece of newspaper, light it on fire and burn that no webbing out of the tree. Well, I ask you, why would you damage your tree that way? Okay, don't burn them out. Don't prune the branches away, you have nothing left. The branches, the webbing is made in the crotches of the tree in the springtime. And you simply have to take a stick, break up or a tool and break open that netting and allow the, um, the larva to, to the young caterpillars to fall out onto the ground where they will be consumed by birds, okay? They do overwinter as eggs and the egg mass is in the upper left corner of the slide here showing you the, the shiny um, um, enclosure around a branch. You can find those in the wintertime. If you spray them, if the spray is not likely to be effective if they are inside the webbing, okay? Because it has to come in contact with young caterpillars. One good thing to know is that you can look for them when the forsythia is in full bloom. I misspelled that word, forsythia, it's F-O-R-S-Y-T-H-I-A. Um, and, um, and know that, that, that they're going to be active about that time. This is a springtime problem with, with netting that occurs in the webbing, webbing that occurs in the crotches of, of, plant, of trees like cherry, but they're not very selective. Fall webworm is, has, is often confused and called tent caterpillars, the fall webworm occurs in the late summer and it occurs on the ends of branches and not the crotches. You want to look for these about the time that the oak leaf hydrangeas start to bloom. Pruning them out is effective. You can remove the, uh, the, the webbing and the nest of, of caterpillars, but usually this is not treated because it's way up in the top of the tree and it's, it's an aesthetic prop. They usually don't do enough damage to uh, warrant any kind of treatment at all. Gypsy moth, on the other hand, you will recall about 30 years ago, we had um, severe gypsy moth infestations. And when I started this job 15, 14 years ago, we were still actively doing gypsy moth spraying and uh, monitoring for egg masses. Well, you haven't lived until you've worked with a, uh, a, a, a uh, binoculars with your head back like this for a couple of hours, okay? looking for egg masses and the egg masses are, are on the next slide, but these are active at the, when the red buds start to bloom, all right? You need to keep the trees protected and the, the, path, the, the pest has been with us, it's invasive, pest has been with us long enough to develop its own set of pathogens and predators which prey on the, on the um, uh, caterpillar, the larval stage. Okay, so this is coming to some kind of little balance here, okay? Um, but the adult is kind of an off-white, dirty looking uh, moth, um, and the egg masses look like pieces of foam that have, you know, that have been extruded onto tree bark. Ambrosia beetles, on the other hand, are um, a question we get every year. Ambrosia beetles are very, very small. Um, it's very hard to see the holes that they make into the, into the bark. And the problem is that they, they bore their holes into the bark and this top picture on the left shows, um, there's no, there's no um, scale here, but it shows how they go into the tree and go down into the wood, deeply into the wood. You can also see why they're called ambrosia beetles because ambrosia beetles, they're a, um, um, they cultivate fungi and this white stuff that's in the tunnels and this in the um, bore, bore tunnels here, this fungi that they use to feed their larvae, okay? Ambrosia beetles. Ambrosia is the fungi, right? <laughs> um, but they act in spring to fall, the adults over winter in leaf litter. So this is where sanitation comes in. If you can clean up the leaves underneath infected trees, you will have, uh, we'd be able to reduce the population to some extent. They emerge with the spring's warm weather. And what happens then is they, as they begin to bore into the tree, they make these, um, these, these little fast tubes, they're called. And the fast tubes extrude from the, from the bark of the tree 
and uh, eventually break off. And they can actually get out to be about, about an inch long. And because they are um, in the wood and below the cambium level, treatment is not usually attempted for Ambrosia beetles, okay? There are some, there are some, um, some products, some, some arborists that are attempting to, to treat Ambrosias. And in fact, they are considered to be a factor, one of several factors in um, the oak decline, which was at, uh, we all experienced here two years ago. Some of you will remember that we lost many, many trees in this area due to uh, uh, an aggregate of stressors, um, fluctuating water levels, fluctuating temperatures, um, ambrosia beetle, stressed out trees attract additional um, pat, uh, pests that attack them. And of course, um, many trees succumb to it. Right plant, right place, right time. Um, but the best treatment for this is going to be to keep your trees healthy. Ensure that the trees are properly watered, that you have chosen a correct tree for your situation, and that they are properly mulched. If you get an ambrosia beetle infestation, the trees really should be removed in order to prevent the beetles from spreading. Spider mites uh, are something we deal with on an annual basis. Our big two are southern red mites and two spotted spider mites. Um, they're not really insects. They're more related to spiders as they have eight legs. And they are though very, very destructive uh, and can require treatment for best results. They're very tiny, they're almost impossible to see, but what we do see is the damage that they do. And on this slide at the top, you can see the, uh, an extreme case where the photos, um, the, the um, um, chlorophyll has been sucked out of the cells of the leaf and it's gone from being a green leaf to being a bronze leaf. Here are two other kinds of, um, of um, damage that you can see. This is boxwood mites here, uh, which again, you can see the stippling of the leaf. They feed on the bottom of the leaf. They also are ones on spruce mites that feed on arborvitae and other evergreens. But one of the biggest plants problems of a mite is going to be the um, mite damage that's done to Alberta spruce. Everybody loves Alberta spruce. Um, we need to encourage beneficials. We can wet down the foliage with a hose in hot, dry weather when the mites are most active. Dormant oil can be used to uh, help cut down on the number of overwintering eggs. And of course, insecticidal soap sprays um, can be combined in season with the dormant oil being used pre-season to um, help control spider mites. But this is Alberta spruces, however, are just one of a good example of right plant, right place. Alberta spruces come from Alberta. Okay, they are used to and prefer colder weather. The hot weather that we have here um, just is, is very stressful to them and causes a lot of problems. Tip moth, um, are, uh, pine tip moth, are a, a group of insects that attack all pines, uh, except slash and longleaf pines. Um, and I'd love to see longleaf pines get established here. They're large trees that are not quite ready for our colder, colder uh, weather. Uh, but these feed at the base of the shoots and the buds of the ends of the branches of pines. I've seen this on mugo pine here. And the adults uh, will emerge um, in one to two weeks and heavy attacks by the larva that are burrowing through the, uh, the tissue of the tip of the branch cause bushy, crooked, distorted growth. And the bad news, the really bad news is it can be four generations per year. So if you have a problem like this, sometimes you can prune it out. If you prune down the tips of the branches, you can get the larva, uh, larva stage while it's living inside the branch. There are also pheromone traps and of course, um, um, systemic insecticides that can help control the um, insect that's inside the branch. Dogwood borers, um, a very cool looking adult insect, which lay their eggs at the base of dogwood trees. 
and the eggs hatch into uh, larvae that bore into the tree and cause the tree to um, swell at the base. I have seen this in Alexandria on a couple of occasions. Mostly this happens when the tree is damaged from weed whackers or lawn mowers. When the adult uh, insect is attracted to uh, the damaged wood, lays its eggs and the rest is history. So avoid mechanical damage, remove grass, remove the, um, the, the, the uh, um, you know, tendency to damage it with mowers or weed whackers and uh, protect the tree from, from that. Use pheromone traps to, to monitor this um, and so that you know when to treat them. But you can also use phenology. And phenology, uh, we've talked about already just slightly, is the name that we give to the, co, uh, the correlation of, of bloom time with insect development. And this particular insect has, is known to be active at the same time that the mock orange and Washington hawthorn are in bloom. We're not gonna see the adult. We are gonna see the mock orange, much easier to see, okay? All right. Aphids uh, are, are very common uh, in our trees and, uh, and, and other plants too. And there are lots and lots of different kinds of aphids. Oh, they come in all colors of the rainbow, I think. Um, the top left picture shows a Sonara aphid, which is a, um, a, a pest on evergreen trees. The uh, bottom left picture shows a witch hazel leaf gall aphid, which is kind of a cool pest because it requires two different plants to complete its life cycle. This is a, the, the aphids feed on the birch and lay their eggs eventually on, um, on uh, witch hazel where they develop the galls that look like witches hats, cone galls on the, on the witch hazel. Very cool, very cool insect. Um, the bottom right picture shows an infestation of um, aphids on an oak leaf uh, and what happens with these aphid populations was filled up to very big numbers very quickly is that you have copious quantities of what is called politely honeydew. The excrement from these sap sucking insects passes through their bodies and it, it comes out uh, a, a very sugar rich exudate which falls down on everything underneath it leaves, cars, you know, furniture. Um, you have, if you have it outside underneath a tree that has, has aphids, you have seen the sticky stuff falling on your windshield every year. That sticky stuff, that, that honeydew, will eventually develop sooty mold. And the top picture shows sooty mold with the blackening of the bottom of the leaf. We see this every year from, on hollies. We see it on, on magnolias. Um, lots of trees that are infested with these in the heavy populations of not only aphids, but also scale insects will develop sooty mold. The sooty mold is, is not a problem for the tree. It is merely a, an indicator that you have an aphid or a scale population that's feeding on the sap of the tree. The aphids also cause the um, deformed or twisted leaves and stems, um, stunted growth. Um, you'll see the ends of the branches where aphids are infesting it to be um, kind of curled and distorted looking. But the good news is there are lots of predators for aphids. Ladybugs, lace wings, those are the most common predators for aphids, but there are also parasitic wasps and some birds that also help control aphids. Your best control for these is going to keep your garden pesticide free, seriously. The spraying will never get rid of all of your aphids. It won't, even if you repeat it, because some of them will always survive. And what happens is they build up resistance to the, to the insecticide and pretty soon you have a, a different problem that has to be treated in a different way. So your best option is to keep your plant um, pesticide free, plant flowering plants to attract the predators, keep your plant healthy. And for smaller plants, sometimes a strong uh, stream of water from a hose can knock off um, your, not only your aphids, but also the sooty mold and help prevent that from developing. Non-toxic soap sprays can be used on smaller plants. Horticulture oil sprays can be applied to larger trees. And, um, 
neem oil is actually effective against aphids as well. But the good news is that most plants can tolerate low levels of aphids without significant damage. Don't worry, because you're not gonna get every single one. And this particular one, beech blight leaf aphid, I've included here because it's not usually, you don't usually see this pest in the landscape. You see it out in the woods sometimes. Um, this has got a common name of boogie woogie aphids. And if you look up on YouTube a video of boogie woogie aphids, you will see a delightful display of these insects that are massed together on the branches, waving their abdomens in the air. It's a pest of, it's a, it's a predator avoidance technique, um, which they do in unison. And it's a very, uh, very funny thing to see. But it's not funny to see the buildup of the, um, the sooty mold that develops from the in heavy, heavy quantities, it develops from the, um, uh, ex, um, the, the um, extrusions from, the, from the, um, the honeydew that comes from the insects, okay? So in fact, you'll see the sooty mold develop before you see the aphids sometimes, okay? But look up boogie woogie aphids just for fun. Scale um, comes in many flavors as well. This is white peach scale, which is very common on fruit trees. It's common on cherry law and plants of the rose family. The pest management guide has a comprehensive list of, of treatment options and timing for, um, for scale insects. And they identify windows of opportunity that you have to treat the insect at its most vulnerable time. There are three generations of this particular one in Virginia. And there's three opportunities, as it says here, April, July, and August to treat these in insects. Dormant oil can also be applied. And dormant oil is a, um, um, a product that can be purchased. It's called horticultural oil. It's called um, dormant oil. You can apply, it's something that is used to smother the insects when applied onto the branches of the trees um, when they don't have leaves, okay? It's applied in late winter, but never when temperatures are below 40 or about 80. And it's a really great non-toxic way to um, cut down on the um, insect, the scale load for the year. San Jose scale is considered to be the most destructive uh, pest of fruit shade trees and ornamental shrubs in the US. Um, I don't know why it's called San Jose scale. I hope that's not a question, but there's lots of lots of hosts, uh, apple, pear, peach, pyrocantha, willow, cotonia, so they are an opportunity rich uh, environment for this particular pest. They're small, they're only one sixteenth inch across, so this is a great magnification. Um, dormant oil treatment for or, in, or an insecticide for crawlers applied in June or July or September will control these. Cottony maple scale um, is found particularly on maple trees, silver maple, box elder, and, and, and the rest, but it also occurs on many other trees as well. Now, what we also saw this year was something that looked very much like it, and that was the um, cottony camellia scale. And that is a sl slightly different, but this particular springtime, it was rampant on hollies particularly. And um, the time to treat that would have been in the winter time um, with dormant oil, or you can use an insecticide for the crawlers that are active on June 5th and 25th and June 10th through 20th, two generations, okay? So what we have here is an interesting problem that is dealt with in the uh, pest management guide um, with tables. Now you can look down this table here and you can see cottony maple leaf scale, cottony maple scale, cottony camellia scale, and you see the crawler dates. These are the eggs, the, the, the insect, uh, the young insects that have hatched from the, the eggs that are active and out and about from June one through 10 and treatment dates from June 15th, 30th to 30th, and June 10th to 20th. Why do we do this? Because 
it's important to get them when they are most susceptible to control. Um, your pesticide applicators are not going to be applying something that's not going to work for you because they'll get a bad name. You will also get a bill for something that doesn't, that is not effective. They want to make you happy. This table is revised on an annual basis and takes into account the growing degree days that I mentioned earlier and the, the effect of that climate change is having on that is to move things earlier and earlier in the year. So look for this table in the pest management guide. These quality dates are very, very important. And to understand the pests, you have to understand that they vary tremendously. Here's Japanese scale on the top left. You have so many of those, and they are generations of this in Virginia, that you need to treat them at two week intervals from June 1st to September 1st if you have this problem. Do you have Japanese scale? Get it identified before you start a spray program. Um, the canium scale that's also read here in the fourth line down is one of those large, large scale that you find on, on um, tulip tree and, and maple uh, magnolia trees. This has a treatment window of May 25th to June 25th and June 15th to 20th, okay? But it's really important to look at the chart and understand exactly what kind of scale you have. Those services can be provided by our, any of the extension labs in, in county offices, and you can also um, use them, send, send things to the lab at Virginia Tech. The University of Maryland IPM and Landscape Pest Alerts that come out on a weekly basis are an excellent resource for those of you who are in our area. Um, they're also very, um, very informative. They have, it's a weekly report of of pests that are out and active right then and there on that past week. They have report indexes you can look at at this website that take, you can compare past years and you can see pictures of these pests that are in this, this uh, resource. Finally, they have something called a pest predictive calendar, which as I mentioned earlier, is based on the accumulation of heat units during the year, above 50 and under 95. Uh, and um, the, this works, this works. And if you can find, uh, go through your table, look at the uh, past reports and find your pest, you can also find a blooming plant which corresponds to that time frame that you can use as an indicator for your pest emergence and control. This next section talks about some diseases. This is uh, rust disease, which is very common. Uh, in our area. Uh, rust is a very interesting disease because it requires two hosts, alternative hosts. We have cedar apple rust, we've got hawthorn cedar rust, and we have a, 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 the three different kinds here, and quince cedar rust, and they all have their particular hosts. But basically you have um, juniper, service bay, pear, and plants that are in the, in the rose family that are being affected by a leaf spot uh, that looks like this in early spring. The fruit of these particular service berries become uh, infested with the fungal um, organism that causes um, the spores to grow on, on the service berry, uh, turns it into a furry, a furry little fruit that's not very appetizing. If you can get it before that develops, it's still edible. Um, and of course, the alternate host is often the um, um, eastern red cedar. And the eastern red cedar is so ubiquitous that even though removing the alternate host would, um, would limit the incidence of this disease, you, it's not practical because eastern red cedar where we live is a um, pioneer plant which occurs along roadsides and, and is, um, could, could not possibly be removed in its entirety. Fungal disease like rust, again, need to be prevented, not controlled. And if you wish to prevent rust on your plants that are susceptible to it, you have to initiate a spray program when the leaves first start to emerge. Most people aren't gonna do that. I keep waiting for a resistant service berry. I haven't seen it yet. Okay, this is um, um, bacterial leaf scorch. 
Um, there are some bacterial problems that occur uh, in our area. Um, they often begin in old leaves and spread to the branch tips, which is one of the um, characteristics that make it different from something that looks very much like it, which is environmental or heat scorch. Okay, bacterial scorch often has a leaf that looks has a greasy, wet-looking aspect to it, like the oak leaf down in the bottom right. They also often have a yellow halo that is present between the edge of the green healthy tissue and the dying tissue beyond it, which is brown. You can see that in the lower left picture very clearly, but you can also see it in the upper right and the lower right pictures um, where they have that yellow and uneven yellow halo that, that, um, between the dead and, and living tissue. Okay, the only way to diagnose bacterial leaf scorch is through a laboratory analysis. And um, this, is, this is not uh, a usual type of control that is done, but this is something that does happen occasionally. What we see more often, however, in our urban environment is heat-induced leaf scorch or environmental leaf scorch. And here you have a picture on the top left on dogwoods, you got it on Japanese maple on the lower left. On the right, again, there's an oak that is, is, um, has environmental leaf scorch. On the bottom right, even though you do have a little bit of uh, yellow halo there, this is ginkgo and this is environmental leaf scorch on that. The, death, the dying tissue does tend to develop secondary fungal um, decay organisms that can produce that yellow halo as well. And if you'd like to see what this looks like in our area, if you go down to the Harris Teeter grocery store in Sherlington, the trees that are growing along the side of the sidewalk into the, um, the, into the, the garage have environmental heat scorch. It looks very much like the lower right picture. Environmental heat scorch is often uh, uniformly uh, spread out over an entire plant. It would not be a pattern of injury on one side or another, but sometimes you can get reflected heat from a building that will show a heavier um, list of symptoms on one side than on the other side. Okay, um, this is dogwood and the host of problems that affect dogwood um, are sort of legion, but not only do dogwoods get heat scorch, they also have a, uh, a slew on uh, the like lower left picture. They also have a slew of fungal diseases, most of which are not, um, not something you want to um, worry about. It does cause stress for people who like the beautiful dogwood trees, but the pest management guide lists anthracnose particularly. Um, it lists powdery mildew, it lists septoria leaf spot, it lists spot anthracnose, this one over here on the right side, as um, problems that may benefit from treatment. But the discular anthracnose is often fatal. So, um, you know, just, just uh, be aware that the, your identification of the plant problem is as important as identification of the plant that has the problem. Here are problems with maple trees, tire spot on the upper left and flatness on the right top. Zonate leaf spot gets its name from its, uh, you can the, uh, it's a, uh, and, uh, the way it expands around the um, um, veins of the plant. On the left, of course, purple-eyed or purple-bordered leaf spot. And again, the pest management guide lists the problems that maple ha maples have in our area. And zonate leaf spot, purple-eyed leaf spot, verticillium wort, which we're going to talk about in a minute, uh, are all identified as being problems that may warrant treatment or may be bad enough to warrant treatment. The other thing I want to show you here is that the, um, you can see on the zonate leaf spot, you can see the halos, um, the, the, not the halos, but the, um, the, the, what looks like rings within the leaf spot. You have a center and then you have these rings, this um, um, circumference that, that gradually grow bigger. Uh, and that is definitely a, a, uh, an indicator of a fungal disease problem, okay? All right. You're going to treat this plant this time of year? Probably not, because the leaves are starting to shut down their defenses. But if you can identify the pest problem accurately, it may warrant keeping, may alert you to the need to keep a sharper eye out next year. 
Okay, root-borne diseases like Phytophthora are also very, very common on many kinds of plants. 900 species are, can be host to this Phytophthora. Um, it is often, uh, it looks like a, a plant that is, is, has Phytophthora problems, root rot, um, looks like it's drought stress. It looks like the leaves are wilting on the tree. Um, it has yellowing of the leaves. It can, um, it can cause the leaf to die and then stay on the plant. And of course, ultimately, it can shut down the ability of the plant to take up nutrients and water from the soil and result in death of the plant. Again, right plant, right place. This is a problem that occurs in wet sites where you don't have enough oxygen in the soil. Make sure that you do um, drainage uh, tests uh, on your land before choosing a plant to make sure that you do have sufficient drainage. I have a, um, I had a presentation a while back that I talked about um, um, the work that my son is doing in North Carolina to raise his, his soil level to be, to have a vegetable garden because his level soil, his grade soil has a, a, a compressed um, hard pan layer about a foot below the surface and water drains very, very slowly. He had trouble growing vegetables in that, so I told him to raise it up. He's working on that by building soil with wood chips. Verticillium rot is another soil-borne uh, fungal organism, which, which, if it attacks a tree, kills it very quickly. Um, the the uh, fungal organisms affects the vascular system and it causes um, brown streaking in the wood that can be seen in both cross section as well as um, um, longitudinal cuts. The, it is an opportunistic disease which attacks a stressed plant and um, can be mitigated by choosing resistant varieties, um, choosing planting plants that are not susceptible to it, uh, maintaining good drainage, and as well as um, you know, in, you know, helping your your plant to stay healthy. Here's a list of of susceptible species, and this is a list that I consult often whenever I get a, a call here about a tree that has um, suffered um, um, a quick death. Trees like um, elm, maple. And common trees, uh, there, there are some that are very susceptible to this. And so if you have a wet site that may be um, a challenge, stay away from species that might be um, susceptible to this disease. Maple, I had a, um, a red maple tree on my property in Indiana. It leafed out, it's about 30 feet tall, has a circumference of about, um, oh, I don't know, maybe 12 inches, 14 inches. And um, it was old and uh, leafed out one spring and was dead within a month. Mushrooms are the fruit and bodies of wood decay organisms. We need these organisms. Without them, we would be, we would never have anything a lot away, okay? So these perform a very valuable service in our, in our ecosystem. Some of them are even edible. Um, be careful though, not only about eating them, but be careful about uh, taking them for granted. If you see mushrooms, fruit and bodies of mushrooms growing on the trunk of a tree uh, or on the, in the lawn where it might be coming off of the roots of the tree, you should have that tree, that tree stability assessed. These are the fruit and bodies that only develop long after the mycelia have been hard at work on feeding on the dead wood in the tree. And you can see the lower left picture it has a dead wood exposed between the healthy bark tissue here. The mushroom is growing on that dead wood and eventually weakens the wood and it can cause the tree to be structurally unstable. If you have mushrooms growing on your tree, you need to consult an arborist to determine whether or not the tree is structurally sound before it causes problems. Okay, that's all I'm gonna say about that. So the other things that come onto trees that we're just, probably not going to treat, okay? Armillaria root rot. Uh, Armillaria, again, is a fungal um, mycelia organism that will feed on the dead wood. It's feeding on dead wood, okay? The tree is already dead. It is a decay organism 
which um, you're not going to be able to treat because it is just uh, rampant throughout the plant, the, the plant material. Hypoxylon canker in the picture here um, is another um, um, fungal problem that can be avoided by keeping the plant in good health and trying to um, um, you know, provide optimal conditions for it to grow in. Ambrosia beetle and chestnut borers are insects that are, are not only difficult to assess the amount of damage that has been caused, but oftentimes the evidence of their presence doesn't come until it's way too late to avoid the damage to the tree. So if you keep the tree healthy, you will be able to provide, it will be able to provide its own defenses against these kinds of problems. Okay. We're going to stop here for um, some questions. Um, next session is going to include some information about reportable pests and resources that you can use. And of course, this beautiful tree here is a butternut, uh, uh, a tree of the, of, in the, in the related, related to walnuts, that uh, a picture that I took in July in Ohio. So um, Nicole, what do we got? Sure, yeah, we have a handful of questions here, Kirsten. Um, so one is about anthracnose in black maple and well first the questioner wants to confirm she has leaves that have turned black and fell this spring and then the previous spring so two years in a row this has happened now. Uh, the writer believes it's anthracnose and is wondering how do you actually treat it if that's the case. I'm not sure what kind of black type of um, discoloration what would cause that black discoloration without seeing it. Um, one of the things that we hope to try to develop through these public education classes is a way for people to send pictures and to show us in real time and discuss the problems that occur um, um, without a picture or an idea of what's going on with the tree. The best thing I can do is to tell you to keep the tree healthy and to um, avoid uh, any kind of stress on the tree. Um, we've had a couple of people ask about oak leaf mites, um, if we're done with them for the season, and I guess just in general, how to handle them. And the oak itch mites, um, as with any other insect supply, if they have the favorable conditions on a food supply, they're going to explode in, in, in population levels. The oak itch mites were thought to be um, um, feeding on the cicada, um, cicada larva that are for all intents and purposes finished now and um, uh, have, have retreated into the ground for the next stage of their life cycle. Um, correspondingly, the oak itch mite bites have stopped on um, people have stopped as well. And um, so that was a, a kind of an interesting experience. But oak mites and, and other tree insect pests like mites and scale in large trees um, need to be treated with either systemically um, by an arborist who can apply a product that can um, go up into the tree or can be treated by increasing plant diversity and attracting the predators that will help control those, those mites. Um, we have another question about southwest damage, and is there a way to treat it? Yes, you can. You can. Um, if uh, this is a problem, particularly on young trees, and um, interestingly, it doesn't occur here as often as it occurs further north, because we don't have the extremes of temperature here. It doesn't get so cold here, um, but. Young trees that have very thin bark, like fruit trees, service berries, um, um, and other trees like that that have smooth, very thin bark, should be protected when they're in an exposed area, when they're exposed to a southwest um, angle um, for a full sun from the southwest side. Um, they should be protected with a white or other kind of coat, you know, wrapping around the trunk for a few years until the bark develops enough thickness to withstand that freezing and thawing cycle. But, um, so that's a, sounds like that's a preventive. So if it's already occurred, is there, is there anything ah. you can do? Okay. Um, you can treat it the way you would treat a, um, um, a 
from mechanical injury from, from a machine, a lawnmower, or something like that, um, a construction damage type injury. And if you can get it while it's fresh, you know, the damage while it's fresh, you can take a very sharp knife and go down the outside of the damaged wood um, to far enough out so that you are cutting into um, a, the, the green, you can see the green cambium level, okay? And if you can remove that damaged bark um, and cut that back to the edges where the, um, where the tree can begin to regenerate the, the, the um, adventitious growth that will cover that damage. Sometimes you can be successful in helping the tree to, um, to, to recover that injury. Um, we have another question about Japanese beetles and whether they're a problem here. Japanese beetles, I, I, um, they are mostly a concern on, on, on smaller shrubs and, and, um, and perennial plants and annual plants that can't withstand the amount of damage that they do. Um, in, in large trees, they rarely accumulate in such high numbers that they do significant enough damage to, to threaten the health of the tree. The, I haven't seen them be a real problem for a number of years. Um, they do occur, I do see them every year, but I don't see them so often. Okay. Okay, um, I have another question about verticillium. And is it the same in trees as, as it is in tomatoes? And if so, are they able to spread from one to the other? Um, the, the, the verticillium work does affect plants like tomatoes. Um, I have seen it here and, and it's, it's very dramatic um, when, it, when it occurs. Um, Basically, verticillium, you just need to know that you cannot plant, if it, if it happens to you, you cannot plant another plant in that area. Um, if it spreads, uh, another plant is susceptible to verticillium. If it spreads from one plant to another, it's, it's more a case of the, um, the, the, the pathogen spreading in the soil. It is a soil-borne organism. It doesn't really spread from one plant to another. It's, it's in the soil. Okay, so it's not, okay, got it. Right. Um, we have another question about tree whips. Um, the gardener mentioned that his uh, condo association planted some and they're about five years old and doing well and is wondering what to expect as they grow. And I think in particular in comparison to larger trees that are typically planted here, I'm guessing if they think there'll be a better outcome with the whips. Um. That has, that has been advice that I have given to many people as well. Um, younger trees often, uh, especially if they're planted correctly at the beginning and not planted too deeply, um, they often have a better chance of succeeding than an older specimen that is purchased or, you know, from a nursery or a garden center. The problem is that the younger trees are, are less stressed by, by the digging, by the, by the by the unpotting, if you will, and the planting and recover from that stress, uh, whatever happens, much quicker and easier than a larger tree does. And so what that means is that the smaller trees often catch up to the larger trees in, the, in, in, in rapid growth. Yeah, I, I, I strongly advise you, know, you to buy the smallest plant, the youngest plant you can possibly stand and plant that. Yeah, transferring does make it, it's easier to transfer them that way. Um, I have a question about the mushrooms and how is structural soundness of a tree evaluated if mushrooms are observed near the base? That's a great question. Um, the, the International Society of Arboriculture, which license, which is the licensing body for the certification of arborists, um, um, you, you are strongly recommended to use a certified arborist when, when doing this and to use one that has a sp special training called TRAQ, TRAC, uh, Tree Risk Assessment Quotient, okay? This is a special advanced training uh, that some arborists elect to, to take, which allows them, which gives them special training in assessing how, um, how sound a tree might be, um, how, um, how much damage is to the interior of the tree. I think it's important to remember that 
the, the, the structure of the tree, the, the, the way a trees are built often hides a lot of damage that we can't see. I've seen, and probably you have two giant oak trees come crashing to the ground that are beautifully healthy on the top, but have no root system. And they simply, um, uh, the root system fails either due to root rot or, um, or lack of space to expand in. Uh, and the tree um, certified arborist who can do um, things like um, um, boring, do core assessments to determine how much dead wood uh, is inside the tree, how much rotten wood is inside the tree. And if there's a certain percentage of rotten wood inside the tree, they will advise for the removal of the tree. Um, I know that you touched on these earlier, but just I guess to um, really confirm and underscore, for aphids, um, is there is there a best time to spray or do you really think that we should just not spray for aphids, particularly on cherry trees? Um, aphids are an annual problem. They're gonna, they're gonna, you're gonna have aphids every year, whether you want to or not. Um, your best, most environmentally friendly way to deal with them is going to be to use um, mechanical tools like water sprays to knock them off the plant, um, to use resistant varieties of plants that will help withstand aphid infestation better, to plant lots of flowering plants around the base of your trees or in the, associated with your, your landscape to attract the beneficial predators that will feed on aphids um, and to avoid the use of, of, of chemicals altogether, simply because the repeated use of them is going to damage those beneficial insects that will help you be helpless to you. So if you are not having um, um, seriously debilitating populations of aphids and in a tree, you're not going to know. It's going to be up on top of the tree and so on. I have a... Um, a dying oak tree, um, which is adjacent to a parking place that I use occasionally. And in the springtime, my car, my windshield is covered with that sticky um, honeydew that comes from the aphids. I know that there's no way that I can treat the top of that tree. So we put up with it and hope that, we, that the natural predators and the natural processes will help maintain a balance. And again, anything you can do if you take nothing away today except this, anything you can do to improve the health of the tree will help the tree maintain its own internal defenses against insects and diseases. What, what was the plant problem you were talking about? Well, it's the best time to spray for fungus on dogwood. And on dogwood, oh, okay. And earlier you said the best time to spray was pre-emergent. And so I guess just having a more specific frame. Okay. Um, Fungal diseases must be prevented. They can't be controlled after they are, they can't go away like an insect infestation might once you've discovered them, okay? So um, once you've discovered them, damage is done. So the best option for controlling fungal disease is going to be prevention. Prevention can consist of things like increasing light to your plant. If you have a fungal infection of dogwood tree under the shade of another tree, um, can you limb up the larger tree above it to increase light? That doing so will also increase air circulation, which will also help uh, reduce um, uh, fungal disease. So increase light, increase air circulation. Um, try not to add to the problem of rainfall by using overhead watering of any kind at all, um, because the leaves that stay wet going into the evening hours well, are perfect um, laboratories for disease growth. Um, but the other thing you can do, which is really big, if you have zero tolerance for spraying as I do, um, find a resistant variety. Okay, now if you've already got the tree and you have fungal disease problems on it, you're going to have to probably, if you can't change any of the environment around it, you're gonna have to try to look at some of the um, chemical controls for that problem. Um, and then one of the questions, I guess, and it kind of is a nice way to sort of wrap up this one section is about fostering pollinators while protecting the trees and how to essentially identify your beneficial pests from the pests you really need to remove as opposed to the pests that you can tolerate but aren't necessarily happy with. And 
Is there a guide to point to and just sort of how, did, how, how, does, how does a gardener do that? Well, first of all, you utilize the resources of your local extension office to help identify what you have, okay? You can bring in samples to us, um, good guy, bad guy, we can help you out with that, okay? You can also use the pest management guide. When you use, go to chapter four, that pest management guide, and you look at the insects that, there are also sections on beneficial insects in that book, okay? Especially in the vegetable section, okay? But if you look at the um, section on, on the, where it lists each plant, that section will list the most common insect problems of that plant. And all I can tell you to do is, is study those insect problems. You know, take that list and look them up and see what they look like, okay? Um, and of course, if you need help identifying something, you can send pictures to the help desk. You can, um, you can bring samples into us now that we're open again, and, um, and, and we can help you with that. We, we have people sending us 25 pictures at a time and say, what is this weed? What is this plant? What is this tree? So don't be shy about that because it's a service here, it's just for you. So Kirsten, a lot more questions just popped in in like the last minute or so while you were talking, but I know you still have part of your presentation to still go through. Um, so would you like- Just a bit more, let's, let's go on a little bit more and we'll, okay. I'll stay as long as people want to stay. Okay. Um, so one of the questions is about uh, service berries and rust. If we do not want to spray to prevent rust from turning the fruit into orange spike balls, what is the least pollinator damaging spray? If you have, to my knowledge, there are no resistant varieties of service berry that you can purchase that are resistant to rust. There may be a, a, some research somewhere that indicates um, which ones are most acceptable and which ones are least acceptable, but um, prevention of rust, which is a fungal disease on service bears, is going to require you to use a, 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 a chemical application, period. And it'll have to be repeated every 10, day, 10 days to 14 days. Um. Another question that's come in is, are resistant varieties of trees still considered straight species of those trees? I gave a couple of examples already. You know, for instance, with American elm, American elms were wiped out um, in the 1930s and 40s by something called Dutch elm disease, which was an invasive imported disease pathogen. Okay, since that time, they have uh, um, developed, uh, oh, a dozen or so or more resistant varieties, you know, varieties of Dutch, of American elm, which are resistant to Dutch elm disease. And so your best bet is going to be to identify the, that you actually have that disease or what disease you're trying to avoid, and then just search for resistant cultivars for that. There are some problems that there is no such thing as a resistant cultivar. Chestnuts, for instance, were wiped out by chestnut blight. They are working still a hundred years later to try to develop a resistant variety of chestnut for us to use. And I think they're getting very close actually. So um, uh, you just have to search out, understand the problem and then search out what is available in the nursery trade. So then it sounds like the, the resistant variety is, should not be considered a straight species of that, of that tree then? Well, there's, there's some conversation about that. And um, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the cultivar, which is healthy, is going to support many more um, native insects and so on than an unhealthy straight species. Mm -hmm. And so if, you're, if, if the choice is only between a, a between a, a, you know, a, a tree that, that has cultivars that require it to be a cultivar in order for it to be healthy, then, then yes, I would go with the cultivar every time. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. So we have a section here on reportable insects and diseases. And these are things that are uh, pests of trees that um, we have either managed to, to um, deal with or are still trying to find ways of limiting the damage from them. Um, some of the things that we are looking at dealing with that are coming down the pike, Asian longhorn beetles, 
thousand cankers of water, which is a, a complex of, a, of, a, of a, um, an insect and a, and a, and a fungal disease. Um, crepe myrtle bark scale is rearing a huge head in Alexandria right now. Uh, spotted lantern fly, oh sorry, spotted lantern fly, not spotted lantern wing. <laughs> Can you correct that somebody in the box? Um, and of course, there have been past reportable pests too that have enjoyed their 15 minutes of fame, but are still causing problems. Boxwood blight, um, and there's a, a, a new pest, of insect pest of boxwood, which, which is in Europe right now and in Canada, which we are looking at right now. It's coming down the pike. Emerald ash borer, um, I think you all will recall that 10 years ago, emerald ash borer came through and, and has basically decimated our ash population. Hemlock woolly adelgid, which is the picture on the right side, is a, um, a type of sap sucking insect which causes honeydew. And um, again, it's, it's a Dutch, it's a disease, insect, an insect problem which has, um, has attacked the tree, which is under environmental stress already. It's too hot here for hemlocks and has gotten increasingly hotter and hotter. And hemlocks have retreated further north um, and, and into the mountains. And of course, Dutch elm disease. But let's look at some of these insects. This Asian longhorn borer, native to Eastern China and Asia, it's um, still present. It's been successfully eradicated in some parts of the United States where, uh, where it's, it's still a problem. But in 2020, there were six states that reported the presence of, of, of uh, Asian longhorn beetle. And we're looking for it here, okay? So um, one of the things you need to look for are the huge size of the um, antenna uh, on, on, this, on this very large um, beetle. The adults are one to one and a half inches long. The body is shiny black with white spots. And um, it's in South Carolina, of course, it's in New Jersey. We're all surrounded by it, okay? Um, the Larva, which causes the damage, is a huge thing. And you can see the person holding it down in the lower right picture. The Asian longhorn boar also looks very much like and is confused very often for a native white spotted soya beetle. Um, but seen in comparison, you would not make that mistake. You're looking for a shiny black beetle with, um, with long striped antenna and uh, white spots on it. Um, Asian longhorn borer um, symptoms, the exit holes and sawdust in the upper left are huge amount, huge indicators of round holes that are half an inch uh, wide. You've got uh, tremendous quantities of sawdust that develop at the base of the tree. And one of the really um, significant factors is that the flash tubes, those tubes of, of sawdust that are being extruded from the hole as the boring occurs, can sometimes hang on and stick out of the tree, and you can recognize that. And of course, once the tree dies, we can see significant tunneling that goes on underneath the bark. The Asian longhorn borer feeds on, on maples, it feeds on um, ashes, birches, elms, um, London plane tree, poplars, sycamore, um, and willows. Horse chestnuts are also susceptible to Asian longhorn borer. Have a look for this. And if you see these guys, you need to report them to us or to your Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. A uh, thousand cankers disease of walnut. Uh, it's a, again, it's a complex of an, of an insect with, a, with a, a fungal pathogen. And what happens is that the insect makes a hole uh, in, the, in the bark and um, introduces the fungal organism that then produces a canker. But what happens to the tree is it gets progressively um, um, bald on top and, um, and the, the wilting occurs on the branches in some cases because the cambium system is affected. The controls for it are going to consist of isolation of infected trees or removal of them and sanitation. Pick up any branches that fall on the tree, remove dead branches that are harboring the insects and the larva in the wood. Um, you cannot use any kind of control that, that is a systemic control because it's not going to get to where the beetle is. It's kind of like the ambrosia beetle in that regard. Um, it, it just doesn't, it's not gonna be effective. 
So 1,000 cankers has been confirmed um, um, in a number of states. The uh, Virginia is, is in a, has been conf it's been confirmed in Virginia, but not we haven't seen it here in Arlington, to my knowledge. And um, it, it's, um, uh, it's a quarantine state. In other words, wood from Virginia cannot be shipped uh, into the um, non-affected states. Crepe mortar bug scale. Um, this is, um, um, as I said, running rampant through Arlington, Alexandria right now, and some parts of Arlington are going, and we certainly have it. Um, they are spread by the wind, believe it or not. And um, it's been coming up from Texas since 2004 or so, and it's, um, it's all over. Now, some folks will say that's not a great loss, but uh, crepe myrtles make up a huge part of our urban tree canopy. And um, um, the treatment of these is, is um, going to involve most effectively systemic chemicals. And some tree owners may opt to remove their crepe myrtles rather than have to deal with that, uh, with that threat to the environment. Systemic uh, insecticides, of course, take, uh, are taken up by the roots and are expressed throughout the whole tree, and, and, um, and it will affect any other insect that is feeding on that particular tree that has been treated. But some of the products that are used um, include um, known um, um, systemic insecticides, but they're also natural predators. Unfortunately, natural predators are never going to be in a sufficient number to, to be uh, effective at um, controlling the, 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 the vast accumulations of these populations, and, but you do see them. The um, significance of this is that um, the trees that are treated on the left are going to be much healthier with better flowers than the untreated tree on the right. And of course, for those of you who have seen this past year, you will know that there are copious quantities of honeydew and black sooty mold that, would, that are also produced in association with um, this pest. Your treatment options are going to consist of, a, of a oil treatment in the um, in, in, in late winter, a dormant oil treatment of the entire tree, and then possibly spraying if you wish to avoid um, the um, systemic insecticide. Spotted lanternfly um, is surrounding us. We are likely to see this next year. We have not seen it in Arlington yet or in Alexandria, but it is um, in Prince William County. Uh, we, are, we believe it's already in Loudoun County and it has been in, um, uh, first appeared in Pennsylvania in 2014. And since then it has spread to Winchester, Virginia area and um, um, and it's um, kind of become a terrible pest. Here's the current distribution of it. And as you can see, it's, it's spreading down through Delaware. It's spreading uh, westward into Ohio. And of course we have a little bit of it here in, in, in Indiana. And this is a, a pest of grave concern to the um, grape growers and apple tree producers uh, in, in areas as far south as Georgia. So this is a pest that we're gonna be watching closely. And, and I believe like with all of these kinds of introduced pests, there will eventually be a, uh, a natural predator that develops or a pathogen which kills off the population. But in the meantime, it's gonna do an awful lot of damage. And my concern is that um, these are going to be uh, a problem for our area, our environmental concern, because they accumulate in such great, huge numbers that um, people are going to apply pesticides. And of course the pesticides are not gonna be selective for this particular pest. This is what the larva, the, in, the immature uh, insect looks like. It goes through five stages to adult and the copious quantities of sooty mold that accumulate under the trees are going to be um, uh, very present. One, one control is literally speaking fly swatters. And, um, but the other control is removing ailanthus trees, which are their favored um, uh, host, plant, host plants. So again, takeaways, choose a tree for your site conditions. Don't choose a tree and come home and wonder why it didn't do well because you didn't know what your site conditions were. 
Do a soil test. You understand what the pH is. Do a drainage test so you understand a perk test so you understand how wet the soil is on a general basis. Um, choose a tree that has this, is the right size for the space you have available. We see problems all the time when trees uh, that grow to be 60 feet tall are planted in a space that can only accommodate a 20 foot tall tree um, with problems too. So get them, get help for them to get established. Don't mulch, never put mulch around the trunk of the tree. Only use two to three inches of mulch over the roots and make sure you keep the grass and other plants away from the trunk of the tree. Um, make sure that the root flare that we talked about, that trunk flare it's sometimes called, where the trunk meets the roots and begins to widen out, make sure that is always above the grade. Plant the tree high. It's better to plant the tree higher than it is to plant it below grade. Remove girdling roots when you plant a tree and don't crowd them. Uh, if you can provide air circulation and, and um, uh, light, you will have fewer disease problems. Make sure they get one inch of water per week. We've had, not had a problem with water this year, but I have been here some years when we have gone eight weeks without any kind of rainfall at all. So you can help a tree get established, especially in the first two years by making sure that it gets that one inch of water per week. Do not use soil amendments when you're planting a tree. In fact, you're better off bare rooting the tree and taking away everything that's, that's below the, the uh, around the roots before you plant it in your soil. Remember the plants have a lifetime and um, sometimes we have to live with the fact that we can't sustain the life beyond a certain point. Be prepared. You know, if you have an old tree, plant a young one now to, that will eventually begin, will take over the job that that old one is, is doing for you right now. Remember to reduce the stress. Most insect and disease infestations are invited by plant stress and good design of your landscape and, and careful placement of trees can minimize that stress. Try to avoid problems like bad pruning. These are so avoidable. Avoid putting mulch, mulch volcanoes around your trunk of your tree. That just invites problems from disease pathogens, animals, and other kinds of issues, okay? And remember to remove the guy wires. I've seen trees killed by guy wires that have been left on too long. Remember that if a tree dies, that tree still can provide ecosystem services to you. The snags of trees that are left in the woods are valuable, um, provide valuable services and food sources to birds, mammals, and even insects, okay? If you can leave a dead tree snag, the trunk of a tree that dies in your property, you will be helping to increase diversity in your landscape. It's all beneficial. But have, make sure that you've done a, a careful analysis of what happens if that tree does fall over, okay? All right. Arlington has many wonderful tree programs going on here. If you'd like to know about any of them, they, they, you can find them on the web or you can contact me. Um, the uh, uh, wonderful environment, um, um, Department of Environmental Services uh, in Arlington County has got fabulous resources on the website. Arlington National Cemetery, if you've never been on a tree walk there, try to go because they are gorgeous trees. They are, um, many of them are state champions and even national champions. Um, there, there is a brand new Northern Virginia um, native tree campaign which is kicking off this fall and there will be resources for those of you who want to educate in your community. Master Garden in Northern Virginia have a fabulous project called Small Trees Make Large Canopies and this is basically harvesting young seedlings of native trees, growing them on in pots and then give for a year or so and then giving them away to residents. There are lots of nonprofit organizations in Arlington and the area which, which are doing fabulous work the Trees Virginia Tree Stewards and the Tree Stewards of Northern Virginia, uh, sorry, of Arlington, Alexandria, um, uh, 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 have volunteer training and activities. Uh, Relief in the Fairfax County, Casey Trees Program in DC. And of course, the Park Stewards that are uh, a joint project of the Master Naturalist Program with the Tree Stewards. These are all services that, uh, that are replicable. Um, 
uh, projects in your area. So finally, I just <laughs> don't let the gardeners get to your trees because they're going to turn it into something like this. Um, somebody took a tree and turned it upside down and planted a garden on top of the root system. Well, I'd rather see the living tree. It's much more valuable to the landscape. So I'm done. I'm willing to take some questions and stay as long as we need to do that. So we did have um, a couple questions about bare root planting versus potted, you know, tree planting. And someone was saying anecdotally, it seems in his opinion that like the bare root planting has been much more successful. And so that kind of asked a follow up present follow up question about if you bought a potted tree to plant, is it worth Un, you know, removing all the soil around it so you could do bare root planting? What's your opinion? If you're buying a potted plant, the answer is yes, it's worth that effort um, because it does allow you to expose potentially girdling roots that can be pruned away and you have a chance to establish a root structure that will serve that tree for the rest of its life. And um, when you're planting a bare root tree, you need to have a, a mound a, very, a fairly shallow but wide hole that is mounted up in the middle for you to rest that, um, that root mass on and spread the mass over the top of, okay? Um, for a tree that is a bald and burlap and has been dug out of the woods, this is a little bit harder to do, a little bit harder to justify because many times those, those you know, taking the soil away from those roots um, can, can damage the roots themselves. Okay. So I, I recommend it for um, potted plants, but not always for um, bald and burlap. Okay. Um, so somebody said that they had heard the saying, the best time to plant a tree is today. She wants to know, is that correct? Or is, does the tree planting time really affect its resistance to disease or its ability to succeed? So like, obviously we're not going to want to plant when it's a hundred degrees in the summer. Um, but is there... Do you have any other advice on that? Thank you for that opening. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. Yes, that's what they, somebody did respond with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, the best time, the best tree planting time is, is, is um, you know, can be anywhere from October into, into, the, into January. You know, you, you have, as long as the soil can be worked, these trees can be planted. If you plant them in, in the end of September, October, the roots have a chance to get established before winter comes and um, it will have a head start. The tree where the top of the tree is dormant at that time and the roots don't have to worry about supplying the needs of the top of the tree and they can concentrate on building the strength for the coming season. So okay. um, yeah, the fall is a good time. Great. Um, so somebody asked if, do you recommend mycorrhizal fungi for a shade tree that was planted in an urban area and devoid of healthy soil? Well, um, mycorrhizal fungi, fungi are microorganisms that help, that work symbiotically with plants um, to, to help supply the nutrients that plants need to, to, for their physiological processes. Um, they, for a tree that's already established, I think it would be tough to establish that, you know, through some kind of uh, uh, purchase of, of an application of a product. I have, however, heard of good results with folks using compost, just natural compost to spread over the top and aerating the soil uh, around established trees and applying compost to replace uh, bad soil, or compacted soil, around tree roots. Um, the mycorrhizal uh, organisms won't hurt anything, but I think they have limited use. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, somebody said their condo association, they just got a notice that they're, the company's coming to do um, disease control and spray for mites. The person feels like that's probably the wrong time now. Is, would you agree with that? I, I guess I, I would agree with that it's not quite the right time for that. Um, the time to get them would be in earlier in, in earlier in, in the earlier in the season when they are first becoming active mm -hmm. and they're more susceptible. I think right now the damage has already been done by mites, and so um, 
you know, I, th I think that's probably not, not good, good expense. Okay. Um, somebody asked, does crepe murder, um, will it help combat crepe myrtle scale? No. Yeah, that's what, no. that's what I was afraid of. <laughs> no, um, uh, the, the, I have seen this infestation, I'm telling you, they're on the main trunk, they're in the, in the little bark cracks, you know, crepe myrtle has that exfoliating bark, and so anywhere the bark is peeling away, they're underneath those cracks, they're in the crotches, they're up on the ends of the branches, they're up on the, you know, on the main branches, and uh, you can't prune them away. Okay, so and just for folks who don't know, crepe murder is just when you totally cut back the the branches of the crepe tr crepe myrtle tree, correct? Like a real hard prune. All right, and um, our last question, or it looks like we just got one more, but um, somebody has a five foot tall dogwood tree that they think is planted too deep, and it's also near a raised bed. Is it still okay at this point to try to dig it up? Would you, I mean, would you recommend that? Would that be better to dig it up and try to raise it up? Or is at five foot tall, is it probably too late? Yeah, that's a tough question. Um, the tree's been in the ground for five years. Um, and I assume that it was a young tree to start with. Is well, she said it's five foot tall. She didn't oh, say how, tall, long it's been, how long it's been planted. Yes, I, I think that would be worth it if, if it's if the if the uh, if you if you're more than two or three inches too deep, if you're down six inches or something like that. That tree is not going to like that. And if they can do root pruning on that tree now, and maybe again in February, and then in March you can begin to lift that tree up um, by um, uh, the root pruning will help. Um, consolidate the root mass, the healthy roots into a smaller area so you can lift that up. Another approach might be to lower the level of the soil around the tree if you can get good drainage away from it. Okay. Okay, okay. if you're gonna end up creating a rain garden or a bowl or a dish there, that's probably not a good idea. But if you can lower that level, that would be a, a very um, distant possibility. All right, and we're almost half an hour over, so this is gonna be our last question. Um, does deep root feeding help establish trees? Help establish trees. Deep root feeding. Does it help um, establish trees? Yeah. Well, it's a service that many um, um, tree health professionals provide. Um, I have not personally seen the literature that supports the, the, uh, the benefits of that, but it, I, I think it is out there, deep root feeding. I assume you're talking about um, injections of fertilizer or mycorrhizal down into the soil. Uh, if you're talking about injections into the tree um, of, of um, insecticides through the trunk of the tree, I have some issues with that because I believe that the injury that is caused by the um, insertion of the, the delivery tube into the tree trunk. Yeah, no, um, she was talking about into the soil. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it can be useful, but it's basically a a, um, a, a, a lifesaver. It's a, like a temporary, it's like something that's uh, like throwing somebody a life jacket. Okay, it's not going to lead to long-term improvement. Okay. All right, and that is it for us today. Um, thank you everybody who stuck around an extra half hour with us. Big thanks to Kirsten um, for this great presentation today and to Julie um, Hanson-Swanson and Nicole McGrew who also helped with our um, facilitating.